Good evening, everyone, and welcome to a new season of Books and Coffee. I'm Emma Oxford, Director of Community Relations, and I'd like to extend a special welcome to members of the Friends of Concordia, whose generosity helps to support free community programs like tonight's. And if you would like to join the Friends of Concordia, please take one of the brochures which are out in the lobby on the, on the table. We'd also encourage you to complete a raffle card. I think most of you have done that outside, but please put your email address on that, and then that is the way that we contact you to invite you to future events. If you didn't fill out a card earlier, would you like to raise your hand now and we'll get one to you in a couple of minutes? Okay, we'll, we'll bring some in in a minute. The raffle prize tonight is a copy of the book we're discussing, Game Change, signed by its co-author, our speaker, John Heileman. I'm thrilled to welcome an outstanding journalist and a very old friend to Concordia tonight. John Heileman has hardly been off the airwaves since the publication of Game Change in January. A friend said to me just this morning, this is one of the few books I've bought in hardback this year because I wanted to read it in real time. <laughs> well, she's not alone. The success of John Heileman and Mark Halperin's gripping account of the 2008 election is quite phenomenal and incredibly well-deserved. I know how hard John worked on it. Game Change is top of the New York Times nonfiction bestseller list for the seventh straight week. There are over 600,000 copies in print after a remarkable 12 printings. The Associated Press dubbed Game Change the hottest book in the country, and Chris Matthews said of it, the best political writing maybe in history. <laughs> <laughs> well, <laughs> John, John... John is national political correspondent and columnist for New York Magazine, and it was from that perch that he covered the historic presidential campaign of 2008. Before joining New York, he was a staff writer for The New Yorker, Wired, and The Economist magazines. Apart from his political journalism, he's highly respected for his commentary on Silicon Valley and the technology business. In 2003, he authored... Pride Before the Fall, The Trials of Bill Gates and the End of the Microsoft Era, that that was an acclaimed account of the antitrust battle between the software giant and the U.S. Department of Justice. John hails from Southern California and holds degrees from Northwestern University and Harvard's John F. Kennedy School of Government. Twenty years ago, his first job in journalism was at the Washington, D.C. Bureau of The Economist, where the bureau chief happened to be my husband, Mike Elliott. <laughs> Mike is now deputy managing editor of Time magazine. He's familiar to some of you as a previous speaker here at Concordia. And tonight, I've asked Mike to share the stage with his good friend, John, and facilitate a conversation about game change. They'll talk for about 30 minutes, and then we'll invite questions from the audience. When we do go to the audience, please make your questions brief. I'm sure there'll be many of them. And speak into the microphones that we will be passing around. Uh, and when you have the microphone, it will be your chance to ask a question. Thank you very much, John and Mike, for taking the time to be with us tonight. John, um, I love you and I love the book, but don't ever expect me to repeat that Chris Matthews quote about being it. <laughs> uh, anyway, it's, uh, it's fantastic to have you um, at, uh, at Concordia, um, regular visitor to Bronxville. It's wonderful that you made time in, in what's been, I know, an incredibly busy schedule uh, promoting uh, this wonderful book. And I, I want to I start off with a question about the book rather than about the, the, uh, the topic of the book. I mean, as Emma was saying, this has been number one New York Times bestseller for seven weeks straight, sold 600,000 copies in print. 
It's a terrific book, of course, and I'm quite sure that your publishers and publishers have done a wonderful job with it, but political books don't usually enter the national conversation in the way this one has. So there must be, there must be something beyond the quality of the book and the marketing of it that has resonated with people to the extent that this one has. Sorry, is the mic on? No. Microphones, please. Can you hear me now? No. I don't, I, I don't think the mics are on. Hello? 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 Carry on talking. Okay. Um, for, the, for those who didn't hear, I'll just have to speak loudly, um, <laughs> which uh, both, actually, both of us are known for, I should say. Um, political books don't normally enter the national conversation in the way this one did. What do you think uh, has uh, helped explain the extraordinary um, extent to which stories and conversations about this book have, have gone outside the political chattering class? Well... Uh, first, I want to say thank you uh, to everybody for coming tonight. Um, it's never too, late to be, never too late to be polite, my mother taught me, even though uh, no one ever taught Mike that. Um, <laughs> and um, and it's, um, it's, it's the case that um, I, I flew in from uh, San Francisco last night on a red eye, so I'm, I, I'm tired, but I'm, I'm going to make a promise to you, a solemn promise this evening, that I will only sleep through Mike's questions. <laughs> Not through any of yours or through my answers. Um, when Mark and I thought about writing the book, uh, it was the 2nd of April of 2008. This was a book that um, we had not been planning to write. It was not a book that I expected to do. It's not a book that Mark expected to do. We um, had been at a cataclysmically bad uh, John McCain event uh, in Annapolis, Maryland. Um, uh, and at that point, the Democratic nomination fight had been going on for 15 months. The Republican nomination fight was over. Um, when I say cataclysmically bad, I mean it was bad in a kind of funny way. Um, McCain was speaking at Annapolis, Maryland, where he uh, had been uh, once been a midshipman and was doing his biography tour around America to introduce himself to the country again. And uh, we went to the event with high hopes and expectations. It would be a very moving event, and, and there would be you know, 30,000 screaming midshipmen in the Navy football stadium, um, which is where the event was being held. When we got there, there were no midshipmen. In fact, there was no one. It was a, a, an event being staged in front of um, four television cameras in front of 30,000 empty seats and um, about 12 people. And um, McCain's uh, teleprompter, which, which he had had trouble during the campaign on many occasions, uh, consumed a page of his speech. Um, he did not seem to notice, and so he went right through the speech. It says something about John McCain's rhetoric that it really didn't matter. Um, <laughs> that, that the speech is, the page is missing, but he was very angry about it, and, and we got in the car, and we're, and we're discussing, and I had been skiing the week before, and I'd been thinking on, on my skis, uh, just how lucky we were to be covering this campaign. Um, it, it was an unusual campaign, and I'm, I'm, this is a roundabout way of answering the question, because it seemed like a movie, and, and, and part of the way that we started talking about the book was, you know, just really a, an idle conversation. Someone should be making a movie about this, about this campaign. And Mark and I very quickly came to the conclusion that we had no skills as screenwriters, so we couldn't make that movie. Um, and then one of us said, you know, someone should be writing primary colors about this, a novelization of the, of the campaign. And we realized we had no skills as fiction writers, so we sort of backed into the book and figured there was really only one thing we knew how to do, which was to do journalism. And, and, and we recognized, as you say, Mike, that there was um, a perception not only that political books don't do that well, but that the campaign book in particular as a genre was dead. Um, there hadn't been a really successful... Um, uh, commercially a successful campaign book since um, really Hunter Thompson in 1972. There hadn't really been anybody who wanted to publish campaign books uh, since 2000. They had done so badly in 2000. No one published a campaign book of any note in 2004. Um, but, and we faced another challenge, I think, um, <clears throat> and what we thought of in the same time frame, which was that the race was so overcovered, um, certainly the most covered race arguably the most overcovered over race, um, with the 24-7 news cycle and the blogosphere holding forth on a moment-by-moment -moment basis, and we knew the question that a lot of publishers would ask us if we wanted to write the book was, what will you be able to write that's new? And 
I, I, I give us credit for, for, for only two things. One was that we saw that that latter point was actually an advantage. Um, and that as we talked about it, we realized that there was so much coverage, but that the news cycle is so fast that the nature of how campaigns now get covered is, uh, is, is very rushed. And so uh, in many past campaigns, I could remember great magazine stories that I'd read about the candidates um, that were revealing to me and, and definitive. And in this campaign, um, my own magazine work included, I couldn't. And we sat there and talked about big questions in the election. And I don't mean big philosophical questions. I mean just big like questions that every normal person would kind of want to know the answer to. We, we couldn't come up with an account that was satisfying to us of how Barack Obama, um, less than two years into the US Senate, uh, with a last name that sounded like Osama and a middle name that was Hussein, had convinced himself that he could be the first African-American president. I had not read anything that explained that to me, how he had decided to run. Um, everybody in America wanted to know what was Bill Clinton's role in his wife's campaign. And though we had covered the Clintons for a long time and, and were pretty close to them and to their campaign, we didn't know an answer to that, and we thought that, that was pretty interesting. Uh, Sarah Palin was not even on the scene at that point, but a few months later, a similar question would arise, like how did Sarah Palin actually get on the Republican ticket? Um, all questions, and particularly the Palin question that reporters obsessed over for 48 hours uh, and never got to the bottom of, and then had to move on because the circus moved so fast in this game that people never really get the answers to those questions. And we thought that if we took the time and uh, exploited, um, that's the wrong word, but um, used, uh, made use of, are very deep connections with a lot of people in politics. We've been covering politics in one way or another for 20 years each, and we knew almost everybody in almost every campaign on both sides. That was also very important to us, was that the only books that succeed in politics now largely are uh, ideological books, are partisan books, left-wing books, right-wing books. We thought that people in the country might be interested in reading a book that didn't have a point of view of that kind, and that we would be scrupulously down the middle in terms of how we wrote about it, because that's something that I hear when I go around the country and talk to people. They're sick of that everything being totally partisan. Um, we thought if we could do that and we could spend time with people, um, we could uh, bring new information to light. But more importantly, and this gets to the, to the core of your question of why I think the book's been successful, um, every great story has two elements to it, right? It's got great characters and a great plot. And I think this campaign was unusually strong in both those areas. The book is called Game Change because there were so many dramatic turns and twists in the course of the of the campaign that, that were game changers or what people thought were game changers. And the characters were extraordinary. I mean, we often joke that any campaign where Rudy Giuliani is the seventh most interesting candidate is a pretty interesting story. <laughs> um, and these people, the Obamas, the Clintons, uh, John McCain, Sarah Palin, these people were not interesting, like interesting for politics, right. you know, like John Kerry. You know, they were interesting people, actually interesting right. people, you know, <clears> that you would that would be as, as, as comfortable on the cover of People magazine. They were celebrities. They were, could be on People magazine or on Oprah. And the country was clearly riveted to them, and, and we decided that we could take a bet that even a year later that people would still be interested in those people, and that if we could do a good job showing what they, what they were like, not writing about strategy and tactics and pollsters and polling and consultants, but writing about the people, how they experienced this incredible campaign, how it changed them, how their strengths and weaknesses as human beings made a difference in the outcome, that people, we might be able to do something that people would still be interested in. And I, and I do think that a large part of why the book's been successful, uh, to the extent it's been successful, is that we, we were blessed, you know, by, by incredible characters and, and we had a lot of material to work with um, that, that a lot of other campaigns, a lot of other candidates, a lot of other races would not have, have been so fruitful. And fantastic access. I mean, I don't know how many people, perhaps you could, you could say how many people you spoke to, but extraordinary detail from an extraordinary number of people. How, t tell, us, tell us a little about the techniques that you used. We did um, 320 some odd full-on interviews, like real interviews, not follow-up calls, which we did, I can't even count the number of hundreds of five minute, 10 minute phone calls to check particular things. But like 300 and some odd interviews with 200 and some odd um, in the low 200s numbers of people. One of the things that we did at the very beginning of the process was we sat down with each other over lunch one day and did something reporters never do who work for competing publications. Mark works for Time at, with Mike. And um, we, we went open kimono and sort of said, okay, who do you know? You know? Who are your contacts? We need to know who we can get to if we're gonna do this kind of book. And we were shocked to learn that when we made a wish list of every person in every campaign that we would wanna talk to, 
starting with the candidates and moving all the way down to the most junior staffers, there were only a very, a very small handful who one of us or both of us didn't already know. Mm -hmm. And in many cases, we had many years long relationships with these people. So we didn't come to people as strangers. That was important in getting people to talk to us, but it was also really important in getting them to invest the amount of time that we asked. A lot of the interviews we did were two, three, four, five, six hours, you know. And they were like doing oral histories. It was one of the most enjoyable things I've ever done, is sitting down with someone in an unhurried way, some way that we never work in, in, in daily, weekly, or monthly magazine journalism, and sitting down with people and <clears throat> just asking them in a lot of cases, you know, tell us your best stories. Tell us what happened. And going through in a very chronological way. And obviously, as the interviews built up, we knew a lot more about certain events, and we could bring <clears throat> detail to the questions that let people know that we already knew a lot about those things. We did almost all the interviews together, which was a kind of controversial decision because a lot of people thought that if we had two people working on it, it would be best to split our time and, and spend time, um, uh, be more efficient that way. We both decided that the only way to really do a book like this as fast as we were going to need to do it when we finally sat down to write was if we both knew everything in common and that we were progressing through the reporting in, in, in tandem so that we knew where we were at any time, where we knew exactly what we had, what we didn't have, what we needed to get. Every interview we did, we finished, we would do an a, a detailed after action report orally. We talked through like what we learned, who we needed to call now, who are the new people that this had raised, who do we have to go back to if there were conflicts. Um, and it became really important when we sat down to write the book because if either one of us had had to take the time to go back and read the transcripts of interviews we did not sit through, we'd still be writing the book now. Um, I mean, we never would have finished. There were 20, 2,000 pages of transcripts in the end, and I, 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 I just thought that faster reader. Um, there was only, well, there was one really important person um, who we didn't know, um, who was a, a, a very important source in the book, and, um, and we tried to get this person to talk to us. I, I, it was really my job more than Mark's, um, and this person, I won't say male or female, but was very resistant and was not answering emails, was not taking phone calls, would not do the book. Months went by, and we realized that we were going to have to just do this book without the person in question. And um, we, we sold the, the film rights to the book before we wrote it um, to HBO. And uh, on the day that the HBO announcement came out in the paper, I was uh, at home getting out of the shower at about 6.45 in the morning, and uh, my phone rang. And uh, I picked it up, and it was this person on the phone <laughs> saying, HBO movie? When are we going to have lunch? <laughs> so, Sometimes things just get lucky that way. Now, when the when, when the book uh, when the book came out, or the I guess the weekend before the book came out, when uh, when you know there were some stories about it in the in the national press, one of the first stories that uh, that broke about the book was the the famous meeting between Senator Obama, as he then was, and uh, and Senator Harry Reid in uh, in Reid's um, Senate buildings. Yeah. And and I remember you telling me. Uh, uh, a couple of days later, when uh, when we uh, when we were chatting, that you'd been very surprised that that particular story uh, had made such a splash. So j just talk us through that that Reed Obama uh, moment and uh, and the reaction when um, when it was made public. Well, uh, the thing that got so much attention, if you I don't know if anybody here cares enough about this that you would remember, but the thing that got so much attention was the this one particular quote of Harry Reid's where he referred to Obama as a light-skinned African-American with no Negro dialect except when he wanted to have one, which is, I think, a pretty funny phrase. Um, uh, we, we had not, um, we had, the, bo the book was embargoed, which means that no one, it wasn't on sale, um, and, and 60 Minutes was doing a piece about it, so we weren't giving it to reporters and in advance, which is an unusual publicity strategy. Normally, you send the book out to a bunch of people. We didn't send out review copies. We didn't do that because the book had to be under locks because there was news in it. And a reporter in Washington, D.C. walked into a bookstore on Friday night, um, two days before the embargo was supposed to end, and the bookstore had broken the embargo and put the books out. And this reporter picked up the book, took it home, read it, thought that that quote stood out, sent an email to Harry Reid's office. Harry Reid's office freaked out, thought that it was a big <laughs> political problem, and very promptly, publicly apologized to the president. And the president accepted his apology, and suddenly we were on the front page of the New York Times. <laughs> now, <laughs> I confess, I had thought before this um, event occurred that I was both a reasonably sharp student of uh, American media dynamics and also a reasonably astute and sensitive person with respect to race relations in America. I, I had no idea that this would be such a big deal. And Mark and I, of the, the list that we made of news breaks in the book, I will confess a dirty little secret, it was not on the lists. Um, 
I thought Harry Reid was using archaic language um, that m many people of his generation either use or it's in their minds because that was an acceptable word in the 1960s. As you know, it was the preferred word for African Americans for a period of time. I, it doesn't shock me that it would have come out of his mouth. It didn't shock me at the time. I thought it showed his age, but not that he was racially insensitive. And it didn't show me that he was racially insensitive because of the context. The context was what we thought was the real story around Harry Reid and Barack Obama, which was that in the summer of 2006, Barack Obama had been in the Senate for only 18 months. Uh, he gets a phone call one day from Harry Reid, the Senate Majority Leader, saying, I want you to come to my office in the Capitol. And Obama says he has no idea why. Reid doesn't tell him why. Obama thinks he's done something wrong. He, did, God, he didn't vote the right way. He didn't go to a fundraiser he was supposed to go to. He literally asks as he's walking out the door to his aide, Robert Gibbs, what did I do wrong? Um, he gets over to Harry Reid's office, and Reid sits him down and says, uh, I know you're frustrated here, and I know you don't like the Senate, and that was true. Obama hated the Senate um, and was already thinking about like, maybe going back to Illinois and running for governor. The rumors were kind of out that he was really frustrated with how, um, how slow the pace was and how he couldn't move the needle. Uh, even though he was so famous, he wasn't really getting anything done. <clears throat> and he thought it was just like being a state legislator uh, in Springfield, Illinois, and he didn't like that either. Um, and Reed says, I know you're not happy here, um, but, uh, and your, your future's not in the Senate. You're not a good senator. You're not going to be a great senator, but I think you could be president of the United States. <laughs> and, um, and Obama you know, looks at him and says, what do you mean? He says, well, I think you could be president of the United States. Let me tell you why. And it was in that context that Reed had said to many people that one of the reasons he thought Obama could be president of the United States was for the reasons that he said in that quote, you know, that the, he was... He was doing what I think of as kind of a reasonable political analysis. He was saying he's an African-American who's not threatening. He's well-spoken. Um, you know, again, you might say he was archaic in his understanding of America, but it was not meant to be a criticism. He certainly wasn't being racist. He was saying this guy should be president. So the story, though, of Reid going, going to Obama and saying, I think you should run for president, Reed, you know, Obama went back to his office and told Robert Gibbs, you know, Robert Gibbs said, well, what did we do wrong? And Obama <laughs> says, we didn't do anything wrong. Harry wants me to run for president. Um, and that is a big story in the book, because not right. just that story, but in general. And I, we thought that was a big story. It's obviously become a little bit better known as the book's got more publicity. But the idea that um, people like Harry Reid and <clears throat> people like former Senate Majority Leader Tom Daschle and countless um, Democratic senators, including um, New York's own Chuck Schumer, um, many of whom were either publicly neutral in the campaign or publicly supportive of Hillary Clinton, who had endorsed her like Chuck did, um, were in fact quietly in that summer of 2006 lobbying Obama to run because they thought that although they were afraid to cross Hillary Clinton and though they thought she would be a really good president, they didn't think she would win. And Democrats were, if you remember, uh, back that far, um, Democrats were pretty desperate to win in 2008, having lost a race they believed they actually won in 2000, a race they should have won in 2004, uh, that, they were, that the White House was there for the taking in 2008. And they looked at Hillary Clinton without particular prejudice and said, you know, she's too polarizing to win in the country. There are a lot of states she can't go to. There are a lot of Democrats around the country who are afraid to run with her at the top of the ticket because they're afraid in places like Missouri and uh, Nebraska that she is just, again, too polarizing and she will actually hurt down ticket Democrats. And they had real concerns about Bill Clinton's personal life, which they were hearing a lot about at that point. And their fear was, we don't know what he's doing, but we're hearing an awful lot of talk about this. And if we're hearing it, Republicans are hearing it. And if Republicans are hearing it, uh, we don't want to live through a fall campaign in 2008 where it's Monica Lewinsky all over again. And so they started looking for an alternative. And um, they looked at the existing possibilities and, and thought none of them could beat her. But strangely, and as it turned out pressingly, thought that Obama could um, because he was, even then, uh, going around the country, going to uh, states that Democrats normally uh, can't raise money in and raising a lot of money, going to Democrats where you wouldn't think an African American would be a popular figure and turning out huge crowds. Um, in places like Missouri and Nebraska and Minnesota uh, and North Central Florida. Um, and Chuck Schumer, who knew that really well, he was sending Obama around to raise money on behalf of Senate candidates. And, and they all looked at him and thought, this guy has something. Um, and they all thought that it would be foolish for him to wait because the aura of newness was with him. Daschle, in particular, knew that when he wanted to run for president, he thought he would run for president in 2008. And then he lost his Senate reelection in 2004, and he said to Obama, you know, you think you'll have another chance, but you don't. You'll have one chance, and this is your moment. And um, I, I could. I'm very sorry. I don't, I don't mean to, I didn't mean to go too fast for you. Um, you know, Daschle's attitude was that you only get one chance to run for president, 
and uh, you think you might get another chance in the future, but you probably won't. Uh, circumstances change. So if you have the chance to do this, you should do it now. And, uh, and Obama, I wouldn't say that the, what we call in the book the conspiracy of whispers, um, these Democrats secretly urging Obama to run, uh, I don't think that it was the reason he ran, um, but I think it made him a lot more comfortable with the idea of running than if he had thought the whole Democratic establishment was united behind Hillary Clinton as much of the country believed. One of the, for me, one of the interesting, one of the really, really interesting things about the book is how difficult it is to get hold of Obama himself. He, he's surrounded by these incredibly colorful characters. I, mean, I, I don't mean in his campaign, but I mean the other cast of characters. <laughs> and McCain with this astonishing backstory and what have you. Obama does not come across to me in the book as a warm and fuzzy guy who is particularly enjoying himself during what was uh, a year in which he genuinely made history. Well, yeah, I think all that's true. Um, I should say um, that I always have to start with my standard um, uh, preface. I've known Barack Obama for a long time. Um, we met um, in the fall of 1988, now 22 years ago, uh, when he was a first-year law student at Harvard. I was a first-year student at the Kennedy School of Government. And uh, I was standing on the steps of Langdale Library at the law school, um, indulging in what was then one of my worst vices, which was smoking cigarettes. Uh, and I rather foolishly not only was smoking a cigarette, but holding a pack of Marlboro Reds in my hand. And this tall, gangly African-American guy walked up to me and said, hey, man, can I bum one of those from you? And I said, you know, this guy's going to be the first black president. <laughs> <laughs> At least that's, that's, how I, that's, that's, how I, that's how I tell it now. Um, so he's a, he's a very, um, he's, not a, he's not a cuddly guy. Um, and that's true. Um, and, you know, the, one of the great scientific discoveries of the last year that I'm sure someone will get a Nobel Prize from, for is they've, you know, they've done that genetic analysis on Obama right. and actually proven that he's half Vulcan. Right. So, <laughs> so that's, another, that's another factor. But he, half Vulcan for all you Star Trek fans. Star Trek. Trek. Star Trek. Um, Star Trek reference. He, is, um, he was miserable in the campaign, you know, for much of it. And I think, again, you know, we... I, from the outside, people who covered the race knew that Obama did not perform well in most of 2007. He got off to a very fast start with fundraising and organization. Um, he, there was a lot of enthusiasm for him in the country. He had very good people around him. Um, but the truth was that the weakest link in Barack Obama's campaign was Barack Obama. And a lot of it was the fact that I, I try to parse this into a few different things. The first thing about Obama is that he did and still does, and I think it actually hurts him in some ways now. He hates the artifice of politics. He is a guy who got into the race because he thought that you could have an adult, sober conversation with, with the American people, um, an admirable um, impulse, but not one that the campaign trail really rewards. Um, his answers at debates tended to be long and involved and prolix. He didn't really get to the point. Um, he was a very professorial in those debates. Hillary Clinton, if you remember, in 2007, yeah. destroyed him yeah. every, camp, every debate. Yeah. And every time it happened, he knew it was true. I mean, he didn't think he was winning. He was very frustrated with the fact that he blamed it on the format, you know, and, and thought it was all artificial and why can't we have a different kind of debate. But she was really good at it, and she was very practiced at it, and she knew how to get to the point quickly. He did not. He would do debate preps and say, I have a minute for that response. How much can I get into that minute? And they had to really try to teach him that that was not what debating was on a, on a televised debate. You had to pick two things you wanted to say and say those things and not try to jam seven or eight points into a one-minute answer. Um, he was very frustrated with the fact that every place he went, the thing that made him so famous, which was the 2004 convention speech, was like an albatross around his neck because everywhere he went, he would say, people all show up, they want to walk out in tears. I can't do that five times a day. You know, that's not a reasonable expectation. He, he missed his family. Um, he missed his kids more than your average politician. And, you know, at the beginning when he first set out to run, 
David Axelrod said to him as he was thinking about, just about to get in, he said, you know, I don't think you're crazy enough to run for president. I mean, you, I've worked for Hillary Clinton. I've worked for, for John Edwards. They know where they're going to be to down to every minute, six months from now. And if they have a 105 degree fever, they will still work 14 hours a day. I don't think you need this that much. You want to be president, but I'm not sure you need to be president. And Obama heard that and thought, well, I'm a pretty competitive guy. Um, and I just don't think it can be true that we live in a country where you have to be mentally ill to run for president. <laughs> so so I'm, going to, I'm going to try to prove that that's not true. And I think halfway through 2007, he started to think, you know, you actually do need to be mentally ill to do this. This is not that much fun. And he and Michelle had tried to cordon off, you know, they had bargained with the campaign that he would come home every weekend. And the campaign sort of tried to tell him the truth that that would never happen. But they also sort of lied to him and told him it might. And then it never happened. And so he was miserable. She was miserable. The kids were miserable. I think he was a pretty unhappy guy um, for until, really until um, the, the, the fall quarter, you know, the, the, right. the last quarter of 2007, when he, he finally picked it up and, and, and pulled it together. And it's one of the things that's also true about him. He is um, in the classic um, mode of many smart people, a classic chronic procrastinator. You know, he was a la he's a last minute writer. Um, speeches with him, not as bad as Bill Clinton, but pretty bad. And his attitude towards almost all of these issues is, I'm a fourth quarter player, you know, and fourth quarter players, he's really good in the fourth quarter, he is. I mean, he does really well in the clutch, but it does tend to make him also kind of back off in the first three quarters. I'm afraid he's been doing that for the whole first year of his presidency. Well, that, we'll get to that in a second, but, but you, you, you mentioned the, you mentioned the, the period of full of 2008, and one of the, one of the... 2007. Uh, yeah. uh, no, I, I was, oh, was going to go to 2008. Okay. Um, and one of the really gripping chapters in the book is uh, what happened to both campaigns uh, at the time that the financial crisis broke in, uh, in mid-September uh, 2008. And I guess when historians look back on the campaign, uh, I, would, I would predict, you know, it's the way the two candidates reacted to that, uh, that, uh, that they'll focus on. But you found some quite extraordinary details, not just about Obama, but about McCain. And maybe we should talk about that for a little. Yeah, you know, I think that's right. I think the assessment is correct. Um, you know, the, what people forget about the 2008 campaign, again, it's so long ago, um, was that McCain was ahead in, on September 13th. Um, the, 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 the Palin choice had not yet... Um, become a problem for him. She had, uh, was, was doing pretty well, um, energizing a lot of crowds. Uh, and McCain, in that moment, pulled about two or three points ahead of Obama in the national polls, causing many Democrats to really sort of freak out. Um, and Obama uh, meets with his, uh, his, his advisors in Chicago the day before Lehman collapsed. And he was on the phone with uh, Hank Paulson and and uh, some other people who were in the room here in New York at the New York Fed who were telling him what was going to happen. And he walks into the room and says, you know, the whole campaign's about to change. Uh, it's going to be all about the economy for the rest of the, the, rest of the time. But you can put aside everything else we were going to do. This is all that's going to be, we're going to be talking about. But this is a really vo volatile situation. And on September 13th, he says to all these people, I, we could still lose. You know, his attitude was not one of, of overwhelming self-confidence. The McCain campaign, by contrast, was totally pessimistic throughout. They thought they were going to lose from day one to the very end, and it's part of why they engaged in so many, um, uh, you could call them stunts, or you could call them attempts to change the game, but everything from the choice of Sarah Palin to the decision, the fateful decision in the middle of the financial crisis to both suspend his campaign, uh, basically force President Bush to hold a meeting in the White House that President Bush had no interest in holding because he thought McCain would screwed up, um, and call off the first debate or, or postpone the first debate. Uh, that came, you know, a week, 10 days into the financial crisis, and I think already from the first day when McCain said the fundamentals of the economy are strong, and then the next day tried to say, well, they're not really strong, but they're not as bad as they seem, and then he was for the AIG bailout, and then he was against it the next day, and then he was calling for the, the resignation of the head of the, of the SEC, Chris Cox, and then was saying he, right. he knew that he didn't have the legal authority to do that. That was all like in three days. And from the Democrat standpoint, 
the caricature of McCain that they wanted to put forward was erratic, uh, unsteady, by which they meant in some cases old, but in other cases they meant hot-tempered <coughs> and unpredictable, fighter pilot, can't really trust him in a crisis. So now you had a crisis, a worldwide crisis, that was providing a real-time test of, if not leadership, because none of them were, neither of them were running anything, but of temperament, certainly, and you had this very vivid picture on national television of McCain all over the place, and you had this very vivid picture of Obama conferring with Hank Paulson, conferring with Ben Bernanke, um, and projecting this aura of calm and cool in a crisis that I think was very appealing to people. It is the case that behind the scenes, he was even cooler. Um, and I mean that in every way. I mean, the most extraordinary thing, maybe in the whole book, is how much the hardcore Republican partisans who worked around Hank Paulson in the Treasury Department, many of whom were, are the most Republican people I've ever met. People who worked on the Bush recount fight in Florida, people who worked in Republican politics for years and years. All of them, the people who listened to the phone calls between Obama and Paulson, uh, people who listened to the phone calls between Obama and Bernanke, Paulson himself and Bernanke himself, all incredibly impressed with Obama and thought McCain was a complete idiot. And it, in fact, one of, one of the, my favorite scenes in the whole book is McCain driving, right, to, uh, through Washington to the meeting well, in, yeah. uh, in the White House. And I, as I say, what I say it's one of the most extraordinary things is, I mean, the, the, I, just to stress the point, there, were, there was a Republic, there's one particular Republican who was Hank Paulson's chief of staff, one of the most partisan Republicans, of all the partisan Republicans, who at the end of the financial crisis was so upset with McCain's private performance in this, in his inability to grasp the economic issues and his lack of curiosity about them, compared to Obama who would keep uh, Paulson on the phone for three hours at a time and would ask for very complicated answers to very difficult issues of financial regulation, this guy, uh, whose name is Jim Wilkinson, we name him in the book, he said McCain was so embarrassing that he actually wrote a letter to McCain, and I swear this man has never voted for a Democrat ever under his life. He's a gun-owning, God-loving, um, <laughs> crazy Republican. He wrote a letter to McCain and said, I want my $500 contribution back and I'm voting for Barack Obama. Now, I want, yeah. The, moment, ahead, the yeah. moments that you mentioned, I'll tell very quickly. Yeah. As there, you know, McCain calls this meeting. Bush does not want to have the meeting. McCain forces him to have the meeting. McCain shows up in Washington, totally unprepared for the meeting. Uh, Obama and the Democrats have prepared and scripted this meeting down to a fairly well so that when they arrive, the, the, Nancy Pelosi, Harry Reid will defer to Obama. Obama will speak. He will take control for the Democrats. Uh, McCain hasn't talked to any of the Republicans in the room, and he doesn't really know anything about the issue. I, I, I mean, I'm not trying to be anti-McCain, it's just true. He just didn't know anything about economics. He admitted that all the time. There's a law that says that you can't bring a campaign aide into the White House, so McCain what, needed to be staffed by somebody, um, he felt. And so he got an aide from John Boehner's office, the Republican leader in the House, to accompany him. And this is a guy who had been working on financial regulation for he was the economics guy in that office. He'd been working on this for two years. And he got in the car with McCain thinking that McCain would take the opportunity of the car ride from downtown Washington to the White House to pepper him with questions about uh, issues of financial regulation, what did House Republicans want, what did Senate Republicans want. McCain was on the phone the whole time with uh, Cindy talking about what they were going to have for dinner that night. And when they got to the White House, they got out of the car and walked up to the North Portico and literally as they were about to walk in the door, McCain turned to this young man and said, so what do I need to know about this meeting? <laughs> now, I want to, I want to give, uh, I want to give um, people uh, a chance to ask questions, but I, but I, I, I do want to ask uh, one other question myself that you and I have, have talked about in the last few weeks. Okay. Looking back on the campaign and looking back also on the first year in office of, uh, of President Obama, are the things that, that we can learn from or that you take away from watching the campaign that sort of explain the successes and the failures, the strengths and the weaknesses of Obama as a president? Yeah. Um, the book really steers clear of a lot of this analysis, but I'm happy to provide it for you now. <laughs> um, <coughs> uh, one thing I'll say really quickly, which, which won't deserve that much elaboration, People who thought Barack Obama was an anti-establishmentarian, that he would go into Washington, tear down the walls, rip up the floorboards, and, and, and take on 
the, the entrenched power of Washington, D.C. I say this again with, not prejudice, with no prejudice, just as a fact. If you knew the story of the fact that really Obama was more the establishment candidate than Hillary Clinton was, if you knew that story from the book, you would have had some reason to think that that was probably not true. He's very comfortable in the quarters of power. He's a guy who had been very comfortable at Columbia, very comfortable at Harvard, very comfortable in Chicago doing the stuff he did. He was not a guy who is not Howard Dean. Yeah. Um, so it does not surprise me that he's not been an anti-establishment figure, but it has surprised some Democrats who thought he would try to do more fundamentally to change the culture of Washington uh, and be more populist, I guess. Um, you, one of the things you learn from the book is that Barack Obama, for all of his um, uh, image as a, a, a champion of bottom-up democracy and grassroots um, organizing, all of which he really believes in and which his campaign did very well, as an actual human being, he doesn't want to talk to anybody. And he, he really has three people who he listens to. During the campaign, the only people he wanted to listen to were David Axelrod, Robert Gibbs, and David Plouffe. I've never seen a presidential candidate ever, ever in my life who did not want to talk to his media consultant and his pollsters. Barack Obama had six pollsters. Um, some of them worked for the campaign for two years and met him twice. He, he had no interest in that. He wanted the information. He wanted it filtered through these three people who he really trusted. In the White House, it is exactly the same. And Barack Obama talks to, I don't mean literally talks to, but cares to talk to, really listens to, takes advice from three people, Robert Gibbs, David Axelrod, and swapping out David Pluff is in the role that Rahm Emanuel fills. And it worked really well in the campaign. Um, it certainly worked better than the, the management by chaos and management by dissension that Hillary Clinton and John McCain both practiced in their campaigns. But I think there's a relevant question that many Washingtonians um, with more experience than I have in observing White Houses um, ask now is, you know, the White House itself and moreover the federal government, it's hard to run that talking to only three people. And I think one of the questions that the president faces now and will face more acutely uh, in November when he surely will suffer a pretty significant setback um, in terms of what happens in the midterm elections is going to be, do you, do you broaden the circle? He's not a guy to fire people. He is a guy to strategically, grudgingly, but ultimately, uh, effectively, widening out the circle around him. So I think, you know, it's, it's not surprising to me how he's organized his White House, and it, wouldn't, it, does, it tells me a lot from the campaign what he might do next in terms of that issue. I think, secondly, um, crisis management. There were only two real crises that Obama faced in the campaign, and they weren't really very big crises they, by, by world historical standards. In the fall of 2007, fall of 2008, both were the times when he was losing. In the fall of 2007, Hillary Clinton was ahead by 35 points in the national polls. Many people in the Democratic Party, certainly his financiers, the people who had funded him, were very upset and were panicking, telling him he had to change course, had to attack her, uh, had to do something different. And Obama's attitude was, no, we have our plan. I'm going to stick to my plan, keep my head down, do what we plan to do. In the fall of 2008, same thing when Sarah Palin emerged and McCain pulled ahead. Democrats across the board panicking. You have to attack Palin. You have to kill McCain. You have to do X, Y, Z. Um, David Plouffe, channeling Obama, referred to all of these Democrats who were panicking as bedwetters. <laughs> and, and Obama's attitude was precisely that. I have a plan. I'm going to stick to my plan. I'm going to keep my head down and do what I had to do. Fast forward to now, I think, you know, it's, a, it's, a, it's doing exactly the same thing, has done, has had precisely the same approach, uh, has regarded people who've told him to uh, compromise on health care, uh, change his fundamental approach to, to anything else, to the politics or the policy, as wrong, and he's stuck to his guns. Um, I think the question is whether that is uh, an instance of having overlearned the lessons of history. Right. I have a venture capitalist friend who I saw yesterday in Silicon Valley who likes to say there is a time when panic is the appropriate reaction. And, and I don't know if, that's, if this is that time yet for Obama, but it's, again, a relevant question. And I do think there are moments come in politics where a more severe or more serious mid-course correction is required. It will be an interesting test of Obama because he's not ever really done that right. or accepted the need to do that. I'll say the last thing, and then I'll, take, I'll, I'll stop. Presidential candidates do exactly as much as they need to do to win and not an iota more. So Obama was no exception. And if you step back to 20,000 feet, um, or float up to 20,000 feet, um, what Obama had to do in the Democratic nomination fight was not be a Clinton. And he, he did that very well. 
Um, he had some advantages being black and all. Um, <laughs> but being not Clinton was what he ran as. And he won the race not really on policy differences. He won on temperamental differences, stylistic differences, different vision for the country. Um, in the fall campaign, he had to not be Bush. And, or anybody who looked like Bush or smelled like Bush or sounded like Bush or could be portrayed as being like Bush. And he did that very well, too. What he didn't have to do because of those relatively rudimentary things that were the core of his victories was he didn't really have to do what Ronald Reagan and Bill Clinton both did incredibly well, which was you know, these were guys who had marinated in the juices of politics and policy in their parties for 20 years. They had very, very well-developed ideas about the world, about ideology, about policy, about, in particular, how policies uh, could marry up with a vision of where America was at that <laughs> moment in history and what the role of government should be in taking it forward to a clearly defined future. Reagan and Clinton had that in spades. You could call it a narrative um, about America. You could call it a theory of the case, but they had it. Obama never had to have that, and he, does, he didn't have one still doesn't really have one. And I don't mean to overly fault him for that, but I do think it's fundamental to the problems he's had this year. Because for many Democrats, um, Democrats on the left think that he's way too centrist and that he's compromised way too much and cared way too much about bipartisanship and has been too uh, compromising and appeasing. Democrats in the center think that he's been this lefty, big government liberal. Government liberal. It is a problem when the people who are your supporters are fundamentally confused about who you are. And I think that part of the problem is that Obama has not given people a very clear vision of who he is, what Obamaism represents, how his very sensible policies in some cases marry up to his aspirations, knitting those things together in a coherent picture that people can grab hold of and understand in a clear way. And I think it's hurt him uh, in the ways that I just said, and I think it's something he'll need to do um, if he's going to be as successful as he hopes to be, or as he still has a chance to be. Great. Let's, uh, let's take some questions in the remaining time that we have. Please wait for um, one of the two microphones uh, to, um, to reach you. And again, please make your questions brief, because uh, we have maybe 10 minutes for questions, and we want to reach as many people as possible. I'll answer them quickly. It'll be like a lightning round. <laughs> How would you compare your approach in writing the book uh, to that of Teddy White in, in making of a president? You know, I, I think, I mean, the, the one thing that's just true is that, you know, we, no, nobody today gets to spend the kind of time <coughs> with candidates. Um, we, Mark, Mark and I knew all the candidates and, and in some cases had long relationships with them. But, you know, to the extent that we talked to them, we talked to them in interview settings. You know, Teddy was, White was able to spend a lot of face time in real time during the campaigns with these people and didn't have to do as much reconstruction uh, of, of events as we had to do. Um, I think he was, more, um, he was more interested in a lot of process than we are, because I think for a lot of Americans, people that then weren't, I mean, we, in the 2008 campaign, people knew what superdelegates were and knew the differences between caucuses and primaries. That was not something in 1960 that was part of the vocabulary of most Americans. So he spent a lot more time explaining how the process worked. Um, uh, I think those are two big differences, um, but uh, the focus on character is really is very much the same. I think sure. the, 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 the book that we're most similar to, uh, although it's a much longer book, um, is Richard Ben Kramer's book, What It Takes, uh, which I, we don't call that, hold a candle to, in my opinion, because it's the best political campaign book ever written. But um, in terms of the obsessive focus on the, on the characters, the candidates, and their spouses, we're more similar to him than we are to Teddy White. And that was 1988, right? That was the... Uh, uh, the 1988 campaign published um, in... Like about 19, four years like later. 1992, yeah. 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 Lady, though. Yeah. Um, how will your book change the game? <laughs> wow, what a big question. Uh, well, it's brought me to a state of zen-like peace that I've never had before. Um, <laughs> um, and, uh, and, and more people hector me on the street than, you, than usually than used to. Um, I, don't think it, I, I don't think that it will, you know, people have asked the question a little bit in the context of, I think the, the related question is always, well, will anybody ever talk to you again after this book? And, and Mark and I have found no, um, if anything, it's easier for us to talk to people. The success of a book tends to make people want to talk to you rather than not. And we were really scrupulous and fair and, and very precise with our sources about what we were going to do with the material we got from them. We didn't screw anybody. We, didn't, uh, we honored every commitment we made to people. 
Um, people uh, occasionally have asked how it's going to change, how the, the, the effect of the book might change the game for other, pod, for other writers who are, or other journalists who are doing stuff. I, I don't really see it changing it that much. I, I mean, I, I think we did a, a good job of what we tried to do, but it's not anything, we didn't reinvent the wheel. And, and, and um, I think, if anything, it's a good thing. You know, uh, the, to, to, to the extent that I have a non-selfish answer to the question in terms of what's good, like literally good for other people about the book, I think any book that comes out that's a non-fiction book that sells a lot of books and encourages publishers to think that there are people who are out there who will read books about politics, <laughs> I'm, 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 not, I'm not kidding. I'm not kidding. I mean, the idea that this kind of genre was dead and that, and that, and that, that you couldn't write a campaign book because everyone thought it would be such a big commercial failure, I think it's great if, if publishers, if they can look at, people can point to the book and say, hey, you can actually do this and, and a lot of people will read it. I mean, that's, that, that's great for a lot of authors out there who are going to try to sell books over the next four, eight, 12, 16 years. You don't think it will change the political landscape in any significant fashion? Oh my God, I would be such an arrogant pig if I said that. <laughs> <laughs> Just over here, yeah. Considering that Hillary Clinton as you said, was a much more polished person and politician. How come she couldn't make the change and change her style when she saw that, that things weren't going her way and that Obama was starting to pull ahead? You know, I think it's, um, um, I mean, for a large, to a large extent, she didn't really get it that he was pulling ahead until it was too late. You know, uh, they spent most of 2007 knowing that Iowa was a weak state for them, but ahead in every other state in the country, um, and thinking that Obama would fade away. The, the one person who really thought Obama was a problem was Bill Clinton. Um, and almost everybody else around Hillary thought that John Edwards was a bigger problem for her than, than Obama was. And Obama, in a way, kind of played rope-a-dope with them, not intentionally, but the fact that he was such a poor candidate for nine months um, led them into a state of kind of complacency. And she occasionally would have a, a, an inkling that he was doing something different in Iowa. Um, and all the people around her and her Iowa operation, people who really knew Iowa well, the, the, the former governor, Tom Vilsack, and others said, these kids are never going to come out. Um, they're spending all this time organizing these college kids and these Republicans and independents, and they'll never show up for a Democratic primary or a Democratic caucus. Um, I think, you know, by the time, you know, the night of the Iowa caucuses, she still thought she was going to win. So. You know, it's easy in retrospect. This is a classic hindsight game. You know, it's very easy. I mean, I, and, I, and I've done it myself. She should have been more human. She should have embraced the historic change that she would have represented. Um, she, there are a million things that you can go back and look at and woulda, coulda, shoulda that campaign to death. And there were a lot of problems in that campaign. Uh, I think m fundamentally the problem of not having a, a message beyond it's my turn. Um, <laughs> Yeah. was something they needed to address. And, and, I, and I don't think it's, it would have necessarily been Obama's message, but having a more clear economic message, having been, a, having been a, a more populist in some way. She had a big problem with the Iraq war, um, as the Iraq war vote was going to hurt her one way or the other. But you can 50-50, you can 50, 50, you can 20, 20 hindsight that all day long. She still looked up in November and was 30 points ahead in the national polls, and the only state that she wasn't winning in was Iowa, or the only states she weren't winning in were Iowa and Illinois. You can imagine getting kind of complacent looking at those numbers, and yeah. and you know, it, uh, you know, uh, it's it killed her in the end. And by the time she realized it was a problem in Iowa, it was too late to fix it. Let's uh, go over to this side over here. Yep. Hey, thanks. Um, you said uh, how Obama was not a good candidate for the first nine months, and then he kind of learned and got into it. Do you think he'll have the same kind of learning curve when it comes to? understanding how to uh, like put forth a narrative, which is what you think his problem is right now. Uh, I don't know. You know, I mean, it's funny because the, I don't know how well they understand that that's a problem. Um, you know, I, I always thought that, you know, there's two, there's two different kinds of narratives. You know, their narrative was, you know, we're change. That to me is not a narrative. But, but they thought it wasn't, it worked for them, you know, and so, it, it's, it's hard to convince, it's hard to teach an old dog new tricks. Um, you know, he will have a lot of advantages in 2012. If you're thinking about the next campaign, are you thinking about as a, in governing? Well, look, I, I, let me put it this way. I don't think I'm in any way unique in thinking that Democrats are going to lose a bunch of seats in the House and maybe lose the House. Um, Democrats are going to lose some seats in the Senate. I don't think they'll lose the Senate, but they'll lose functional control of the Senate. 
The day after the election day this November, Barack Obama is going to wake up with a big headache. Um, he is a guy who, uh, the most salient feature to me of his biography that no one quite gets their arms around fully is just how little adversity he suffered. And I don't mean in his life as a child, I mean in his political life. His birth into national politics was ridiculously easy. Hillary Clinton used to often say to me and to others, how can the Democratic Party make its nominee, someone who's never had a negative ad, run against them? And she would say it's, it's March 2008, and he's been in politics for, through in state politics, senatorial politics, presidential politics. No one's ever run a negative ad against the guy. Of course, Hillary then ran a negative ad against him, right, like the next day. But, but it's a fair point. You know, the only thing he's ever lost um, is the one primary race that he ran against Bobby Rush for Congress that no one thought he would win. You know, you think about Bill Clinton. His yeah. whole yeah. political career was <coughs> defined by adversity, huge setbacks, having to, in a very resourceful way, figure out, okay, what do I do next? And improvise after having suffered devastating losses. Ronald Reagan ran for president, lost. You know, people at, you know, Obama never had any of that. And I, I say that only to say we don't have a good uh, precedent for what he will do when he wakes up on the day after the election day. And the fundamental contours of American politics are, if not totally changed, changed in a way that significantly circumscribes his agenda, what he can get done in the second two years of his administration. What he does at that moment, you know, whether he turns out to be as skillful as Bill Clinton was uh, in, in worse circumstances in 1994, uh, or whether he uh, just continues to keep his head, out, head down and tries to do the same thing, even in the face of changed circumstance. He's a smart guy. I don't think he'll do that. But again, I have nothing to point to right. in the past that shows him overcoming that kind of adversity. So we just don't know. Switching gears, can you explain why Sarah Palin became such a phenomenon? Why she I'm became got, why such, she, such a phenomenon? Why she became such a phenomenon? <clears throat> well, she's a really um, I, you have to hand it to Sarah Palin in in a couple ways. I mean, I was on the floor of that convention uh, in in Minneapolis in St. Paul when she gave that speech. I don't know that I've seen very many politicians in a more high-pressure situation than she was in. And that includes most presidents in almost any situation. And in terms of pure political performance, her life had, you know, the, the, you remember what those few days were between when she was announced and when she went on stage. The scrutiny she was under, the glare of that spotlight, the stories that were circulating about her. You know, more people watched that speech than almost any other televised event in the course of the campaign. And the expectations were extraordinarily high. No one had any idea what she was going to do. And she gave an incredible speech. You know, She's a great red light performer. And she has this thing that Reagan had. And, and again, I keep mentioning Reagan and Clinton, but they're both pretty great politicians. You know, Reagan, they, she's watchable. You know, people want to watch her. And even people who don't like her want to watch her. And every time I say that, you know, in, in a very democratic room, people laugh and say, oh, Sarah Palin. And I say, you, when she comes, when you see her on Fox News, do you stop and watch? Oh, yeah. You know? <laughs> well, it's just to see what stupid things she's going to say. Yeah. But, you know, I, I, I think that's, those are really um, compelling things that you cannot learn. You know, you can't make, I mean, she has huge weaknesses. I mean, I, don't, don't get me wrong. But, you know, from her... Uh, what we like to euphemistically in the book we <coughs> refer to as her limited bandwidth, um, you know, to her, her huge substantive def deficiencies. She has major character flaws um, uh, that the McCain campaign found out about, her uh, parsimoniousness with the truth. Um, <laughs> but, but she has a bunch of skills that a lot of people don't have. And I'll say one other thing about it is that she, she, there are politicians in America who tap into... Um, who are like, who are, I guess you call them grievance politicians, right? I mean, part of the thing that's great about Sarah Palin, as a, just as a phenomenon, is she does things that no other politician would do because other politicians would be afraid of getting called on them. Like, you would not write a book um, full of as many lies as her book is full of if you were worried about being called out. Her thing is, she actually, it's like a briar patch for her. She likes being called a liar because every time someone in the, in the media calls her a liar or says she's dumb, it just makes her support stronger. The people who identify with her identify with her because they feel that the liberal elite or just the elite or the coastal elite or whatever, that those people look down their noses at them 
and they think every time they see someone look down their nose at Sarah Palin, it just strengthens the bond for her. It actually makes the fire bro grow, uh, grow, grow brighter. I keep thinking that if, that if the best strategy, if Democrats or liberals want Sarah Palin to go away, is just start, start, ignore her. Don't talk about her. Don't make fun of her on Keith Olbermann's show. Ed, that's, you're just helping her when you do that. John, it's, uh, <clears throat> it's been fantastic having you here. It's, uh, it's Can I, I, want to tell, I want to tell you all one story. Okay. <laughs> that's why I guess really embarrassing. I just want to tell you, no, it's not a Mike Elliott story. I want to just tell you one story because the only, people, the only person we haven't talked to about tonight is John Edwards. Yeah. And we haven't, and we also, uh, the, they all want to hear about John Edwards. Everybody wants to hear about John Edwards and I'm not even, a, I'm not, I'll, you can read the book. But, but I will tell you a story about two candidates we haven't talked about tonight, John Edwards and Mitt Romney. Okay. Mitt Romney could be the Republican nominee in 2012. John Edwards is not going to be the nominee for anything apart from <laughs> CAD of the century. Um, I was on a plane uh, on the way out to California um, a, a week ago and um, rather um, uh, uh, foolishly or perhaps just diligently reading Mitt Romney's book, No Apology. You know. Um, and uh, the flight attendant walked by my aisle, and she, uh, she saw the book. And I guess she confused Mitt Romney <laughs> with John Edwards. <laughs> because she leaned into my seat, and she said, she touched the book, pushed it up. She said, no apology? Not even to his wife? <laughs> <laughs> and I, and all, I keep thinking is that, all I keep thinking is that if that persists as a problem, that confusion, that's going to be bad for Mitt Romney in the, Republican, <laughs> in the Republican nomination fight. Anyway, thank you. That's all I wanted to say. John, it's been great to have you. John, thank you. Thank you so much.